tell me where it all began, this whole concept. Oh, well, ba- basically, we, you know, we are huge film fans, and we actually are, you know, we, we often go to the movies, and we sort of, now that the technology has caught up, uh, we've been able to do what we always wanted to do. And, you know, obviously, we, we don't have long, they're not long episodes, but the, our episodes are short, but we try to make them action-packed and do a lot of special effects. And Leisha had just graduated from AFI, with a, a cinematographer named Chris Bergen, and we were all sitting together, and we weren't we weren't very good at doing nothing. So we decided to just get all whatever resources we had together and um, make sort of a, a a little a little film that we would be proud of and have fun doing. Something we'd want to want to see ourselves. Mhm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think I think the concept here was to to make something that uh, w- would run the course of a feature film it would be the length of a feature film but you're you're airing it in eight nine minute segments correct we we didn't really want to do uh, as much of webisodes or a series per se as much as we really wanted to do we have a 90 minute story that we're just releasing sort of episodically that we're releasing as we as we get it uh, get it done just because you know we didn't want to make fans wait too long and for us it was more fun to to be releasing them sequentially as we went Mm. And so uh, you're on. Is it episode eight? Was the last one that you aired? We're on. Ep- we're on episode eight. We're we're currently working on episode nine. Episode eight is going to be released soon, and we're going on episode nine, which is almost almost an hour's worth of material. And we have up, to, up until about fifteen episodes um, total for the the you know one main story. And once we do that, we'll be able to combine them together for a, a 90, 90 minute plus feature. Well, this is what this is what I'm I'm very curious about, and and Leisha, you can talk to this as well. Um, yeah. The you guys started this, I guess, something like 2009 or so, um, and I think that anyone, it's like a television series in a way where something that's very curious to me about that that process too is the fact that you know it takes a takes a little while to find your groove, to find your identity, and um, your momentum. So when you look at the early episodes of Broken Toy compared to what you're doing now, uh, do, do you wish you could change anything about about it? Um, actually, oh, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't. I, it was a learning process. I enjoy going back and seeing how much we knew the first episode and, and how much we've learned and growing with the character and sort of the technology and the behind the scenes that we we create, um, but I think I think Matt can speak better to you know if he would you know as the showrunner quote unquote <laughs> about how he would feel about that. Well, it is it is something that when when we first started, we you know there was just three of us in a kitchen at you know in the middle of the night and uh, trying to be as quiet from our neighbors as possible. And you know each episode we agreed early on we were going to be more and more ambitious. And as we've been going on, um, we've been you know everything is self taught. We have we have no real formal education with special effects. And so a lot of it has come from learning tutorials online, watching other other filmmakers, how, how they went about certain processes. So we have been growing and learning as we've been going in. So each episode has been bigger and bigger and bigger, which was always the intent. You know, personally for me, going back, yeah, there's there's little things I would love to tweak and make the special effects bigger and more, you know, more impressive. But there is some uh, some sort of uh, uh, charm to our first couple episodes where it was very uh, very low key. Most of the most of the first three episodes actually, the effects were done in Photoshop with the old animation style. We we exported everything frame by frame did it the way a cartoon would and then re-imported it. So it was a very, very, very long process, but, uh, you know, it was sort of fun. Yeah, that's fascinating to me because, I mean, like you said, this is a very much a learning process for you guys, and and you're you're honing your skills along the way and finding new ways to do things and be more ambitious with it. So I would imagine that this experience, um, as it would be for anyone, it's it's made you better filmmakers in the process of putting this together. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Ah, that's yeah. funny, Dink. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're totally better filmmakers. I mean, it's it, 
it, it's it's hard to find your limitations until you test your boundaries. And each mm-hmm. episode, you know, Matt writes something more complicated, and my cinem- cinematographer and I look at each other and go, "Oh no, we can't do this." <laughs> and Matt says, "But what if we could?" <laughs> and so we just go out and try our best because you know the the risk is so low. We're not spending any studio money. We're just spending our pocket money from our survival jobs. And so it's it's enjoyable to be able to take risks, and you know it doesn't hurt anybody or, except my cinematographer who has to run through a field <laughs> or you know fall down the stairs. But um, but yeah, I really I really you know I enjoy the process very much and learning from it. So so tell our audience, uh, Matt, a little bit about the, the the story that you're telling here. Well, basically, we wanted to do a story where our uh, our protagonist, our lead, is actually the bad guy. He just doesn't know it. We we're trying to do a sort of a story where the the protagonist is, is the villain. And uh, for all you know, extensive purposes, if you, if you're actually watching it, watching this series, you'll see that everything he's doing is actually bad. But it's from his warped mind. He actually is thinking he is doing. He is the hero of his own story. So mm-hmm. we wanted to do basically. Uh, we wanted to sort of take almost the classic sci-fi aspect of a Frankenstein monster that's, you know, a, a creature that's gone awry, an experiment that's gone terribly wrong, um, and, and show it sort of through the mind of somebody who's gone through the experiment, who has had his brain fractured, and at, and the, the company and the military desperately trying to contain this sort of storm that they've unleashed. And I would imagine that you had, when you, when you started this project, you outlined that character's arc? I mean, you, you had an idea of where the series was going from the start. Absolutely. We, you know, it, very early on when we, when I sat down and I talked to Alicia, you know, for, for me, when I first sat down, I'm incredibly hyper. So I was like talking about comic books and all these, you know, these things. I'm like, and then he'll do this and he'll run fast and there'll be explosions and helicopters. And, it'll be wonderful. <laughs> and, and just really bouncing off walls like a kid on sugar. And, you know, the issue was very, very important uh, to, to make sure that we actually had an arc of the character, even though the, we, we basically start the whole series almost in the middle of the story. There is no opening where, you know, we, the, the family man goes in for the experiment. Like, we really drop into the middle of the story, um, which for us was more exciting. And, mm-hmm. um, but there, there was a very... Uh, very, very clear for us where the character will be going as the story progresses. And you know, the the trick, like you were saying, is you know, it, it does get sort of complicated in making us better filmmakers. The trick that we've had is trying to tell something that's fun, exciting, pushing the story together within a ten ten minute uh, time period. We've we've found anywhere between five and ten minutes is usually, usually what people really want to watch on on YouTube. So trying to keep something, you know, uh, condensed and very um, efficient time-wise has been the, the biggest trick. And so telling this larger story in, in increments of five to ten minutes is tricky, but it's been um, it's been a, it's been a good challenge. Do you do you set out to? I mean, you have to. You obviously have to further the story, but um, in in each episode, do you try to have it be a, a, a kind of I'm not sure how to put this. You know, it's like short. It's like a short film each time out. Do, do you try to tell a, a well-rounded piece of the story in, in each episode, where where it can stand alone and further the overall story at the same time? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that you know when we sit down, part of the pre-planning. There, you know, there is a, a lot of pre-planning that goes into it, um, mainly because each episode only costs us a hundred dollars, and and for us. Um, to be cost effective, we have to have everything sort of uh, planned you know, meticulously, and a lot of that is well, what is this episode about? What are we trying to accomplish, and what are we telling it in this brief amount of time while we're filling it with sort of uh, fun and silliness? Yeah. So, and the fact that you guys are are, uh, are making it available online to a to a wide audience. Um, I mean, you're in a position that a lot of filmmakers aren't in because you can obviously get kind of instant feedback on it yeah. in a way. What is that experience like, and do you do you engage with the people that actually follow your, your series? Do yeah, you we, we do. Well, we do you actually want to tell about had... the helicopters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, talk about that. No, no, you you can go ahead. 
Oh, well, we had a YouTube commenter that sort of, uh, we've been, it's been actually very troll free, which has been great. Um, and we were very surprised by that because we were prepared. Um, but we had a guy who, you know, was criticizing us for, you know, not being as good as Clash of the Titans 2. Um, <laughs> and, and we said, okay, I mean, fair enough. Yeah, we're probably not as good as Clash of the Titans 2, but you Just know, why relentless. would you say that? Yeah, yeah and, and, he said, well, you know, you, you, and I said, well, we have this very small budget. You know, I, I think we've been able to do a lot with that. And he said, oh, yeah, like those helicopters didn't cost you guys thousands and thousands of dollars. <laughs> and I was like, well, no, actually, Matt just sort of pushed some buttons, and then they were there. <laughs> like, we filmed helicopters, and then we put them in. And um, so it's been, you know, I, I've been really excited about I- I- exchanging with, uh, interacting with the fans. We have... Um, actually kind of a large war veteran fan base, which we were kind of surprised about and didn't really foresee, that said that we sort of represented how they felt when they came back. Hmm. And so it, it, they were like, this is exactly how I feel inside. And you guys were able to represent that on screen. And so there, we've had a lot of support and encouragement from that group, which um, we never foresaw. And now we sort of write with that in mind. And so that was wow. really inspiring creatively. It is, is it is really great. I mean, you know, the 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 best and the worst of the internet is is to be honest the the immediate feedback. And you know, it really is one of you know the the greatest you know bastions of free speech. You know, there is an immediate um, connection that you have with people all over the world. We do get people from Australia and you know India writing to us and and, and have been very supportive since we did want to release it. Um, we do release them for free. We don't charge anything. And for us, we actually don't put any commercials on the episodes when they air. You know, it, f- it felt egregious to us that, you know, for a five-minute episode, there'd be a two-minute commercial prior to it. So we do keep all the ads off it, and that does sort of get a little bit more support when people find out that we are doing it for, you know, $100 basically an episode, and we aren't making any money, and we are truly just fan films who are trying to keep this going. The support has been really, really great. It's, it's it, it, People sort of, uh, they, they've been along with the ride for us. And what do you accomplish with the money that you spend, uh, which you say, you know, is something like $100 an episode, um, especially something as ambitious as this project, it, it's jaw dropping what you're able to do. Do you f- have you felt at all limited uh, by your budget uh, through this process, or 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 has that limited budget kind of freed your imagination in a way to find to find creative solutions to problems? Well, I mean, yeah, I think I think that is an important aspect to it. That necessity is the mother of invention, and that a lot of times, you know, we would we have had to like in, the, in for instance the the last couple episodes we've done in a field. Now we shot it in the field um, because we had accessibility to it. In Los Angeles, it's very difficult to actually get locations. Other other places around the country are almost supportive to filmmakers, and in Los Angeles, it's very uh, limiting because everybody wants to be paid out. And they want permits, and, and it's, it's very, it's very, very difficult to secure a location. So, we actually had access to this field, and um, because of that, we were able to write a, a lot of the scenes in the in it. So, in some ways, we were limited to using this one location. But as as you say, in that sort of limited capacity, we were able to then say, well, why don't we have a giant robot in this field since we have such, you know, sort of a vast open space. Um, let's make the most of it because you know we didn't have any lights to set up and we we you know we were basically shooting uh, shooting during the day, so you know it it, it is sort of a um, you know a push pull in a situation that we you know we do feel the constraints but we we have sort of run with it and and had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, and for the robot, you uh, this last episode it was. It was really a, a puppet that you used. It, it's, it's a six foot tall puppet. It's uh, we, you know, we. It, it was funny because we're huge fans of uh, Jim Henson and uh, Del Toro. When you go back and watch Hellboy two, you know Del Toro did. He, he really wanted to do everything, um, uh, you know, practically. And so when you see, you know, this, he, they do this like bizarre that they had, and and there was like you know all of these you know people in costumes for the most part. And so we saw that we were very inspired of what we could possibly do, and we did a lot of research on <clears throat> on uh, cosplay. 
and all these people who are making their own costumes. And we found a way to actually make the robot. It's a six foot tall puppet. It takes two people to actually move. And so it's, it's very cumbersome, um, but it's been fun. It's, it's neat. It's, it's, you know, it's tricky, it's heavy, uh, but uh, it's, we, we felt that doing something practically like that and doing a puppet, um, the movement and the weight for us just seemed to work better than, than a lot of the computer-generated uh, robots. Mm. I'm so happy to hear you say that because, uh, I mean, obviously you're going to say that because you're a filmmaker and you and a great terrific fan of the sci-fi genre in general but you know i feel as many people do that it probably started with jurassic park in the 90s where every movie since you know they've utilized cg and yes you can accomplish anything with cg now but there's something intangible that's missing from the the craftsmanship of you know something handmade uh and i think yeah, totally we're agree. missing something yeah i totally agree i mean there's i've I've felt recently with the movies that I've been watching with a lot of CG effects, I feel very numb when I leave the theater now. I don't feel the danger that the characters are experiencing. I don't feel the rush of a stunt anymore. I mean, the other day I watched Indiana Jones and the stunt where Indiana is dragged under the truck. And a stuntman mm. did that. And it was a, it was a thrill to watch it again. And I've seen it a million times but I was like, why am I feeling so emotional about this and so excited? And it's because it's, it's a real person. Your subconscious recognizes that, and it connects to it. And I think yeah. that we're just disconnecting from the visual now. I think I so, too. I and there's something agree. so – there's something so. Um, I mean, imagine how less effective something like E.T. would have been if – if yeah. ET were computer an and you know if it were made today it would be computer animated of course. but but the fact that it's you know something you could reach out and touch i mean it it made it so much more affecting yeah and i and i definitely agree i mean if you and you know if you look at the original star wars you know the the cantina is still far more uh, effective to me than anything that happens in in the later um films that he did and mm -hmm. uh, there I do, I do think Leash is right. I, th I think that subconsciously you just pick up um, when something is just a cartoon. It's like, do you really feel that much for the characters in Roger Rabbit? You know, and so when you see a movie like Green Lantern, there's very little difference between Green Lantern and Roger Rabbit. It's just Roger Rabbit is openly admitting that they're cartoons, and yeah. you know there is sort of a, a disconnect when you see when you see the aliens in say Green Lantern that are all CGI, and then the aliens in the early Star Wars is, the films. And um, there, I do understand that there's a, a, a a sort of a cost, uh, you know, a cost-effective use for the CGI, but even that becomes so expensive that there really isn't that much of a benefit to it. Yeah, tell me ab about your both of your uh, your forays into into filmmaking. Was was sci-fi cinema kind of the way in the, the 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 realm in which you started to dream about making a career in filmmaking yourselves, or what? Oh, well, you know, for me, it's always been, you know, Star Wars was like the first, one of the first movies I remember, you know, ever seeing. So obviously that, you know, inspired a whole generation of filmmakers just in terms of what's possible. And, you know, it's it, in, you know, when we were going to do, um, when we decided we were going to do something online, you know, there there is a couple of different options. And, you know, there there are people out there who do dramas, which I respect, but doing a drama is very, very difficult to do under 10 minutes you know, episodically online, it, it, it's not easy. And comedy is, you know, something that we actually very much like and respect, but comedy is also so subjective that when you put something online, it really, it, it's, it's almost, you know, it, it, it may not have that much of a wide appeal. And we, all, our little group together are all fanboys and she's a fangirl. And we all read the Ultimates and all these these comic series, and we were you know really big fans. And it was always a well, what if we could do this? Would we? And you know, especially like I said before, the technology has caught up. That you know, 20 years ago, yeah, even 15, even 10 years ago, trying to make um, a lot of what we've been doing with helicopters and stuff like that, doing that at home would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible. Particularly cutting with film that now that we do have home systems now with Adobe After Effects and Final Cut, it, it, the only thing that we're limited to is really our own effort. And so, you know, a lot of, um, you know, what we, what we were doing was just realizing that we could do 
basically what it took almost a full studio to do 20, 30 years ago, we can do that on our computer. So having, you know, that sort of liberated us to do go back and be our little kids again and think about how exciting we how excited we were seeing sci-fi for the first time. Yeah. You know, and, and, and oh, well, first of all, Alicia, t- t- tell me about you and, and your foray into mm-hmm. loving film and wanting to be a part of it. Um, I actually, I've, I've always been into uh, action and sci-fi. And, I mean, He-Man was like, I played with He-Man and Transformers when I was a kid. Um, so I, you know, I and then Terminator 2, just something clicked with me with that movie and, of course, Star Wars. But, like, after that, I, those were the kind of films I gravitated towards and were very excited by. And, and as a woman director, generally don't get hired to do that kind of thing. Um, so it... I was thrilled to be able to do that kind of thing, and and now that I do it, I get hired to direct. Like I just directed a horror feature uh, that I wrapped last night, <laughs> so I just drove it wow. to the mountains. But but they saw my work with with Broken Toy and said, "Oh, this is you know you're capable of this." I mean, it sucks that that kind of you know bias exists, but it does, and you know it's that's just the way it is. But um, but yeah, I I I am completely excited and and blessed to be able to do something like this. Do you feel like it's because uh, my favorite period of filmmaking is the 70s, and of course we all know that at, by by the end of the 60s the kind of the studio system was eroding and they were trying to appeal to a younger audience and so they for the first time they really let the inmates run the asylum in a way. Uh, do do you feel that we're in the midst of another exciting revolution like that because the technology that you're using, the ability to go out and do this yourself in this way, I mean, it's kind of democratized the the filmmaking process. Absolutely. No, I absolutely agree. And I, and I do understand what you're saying about, you know, in the seventies and I do feel that um, the studios aren't quite recognizing that this is happening. They're sort of trying to hold on to a system that's, that's not no longer working for them. I mean, the days of like you know actors each getting twenty million to be in a movie are, are long gone, and these films that are becoming more and more and more expensive, um, you know, there's fewer fewer and farther in between, and you know that's why we're getting movies that you know are like The Smurfs too, because it's the all about the awareness factor, and there's so much money involved in these things. The studios aren't willing to sort of invest in a movie like Looper that often, so. You know, I do think that while the studios move more and more into the more expensive blockbusters and stuff, I do think that there's a large wave of filmmakers that um, will pretty much start online and do it themselves and eventually will be the ones that move into the theater. They'll slide right in because there'll be such a vacuum there. Yeah, and I yeah. I agree with you. I think in the 70s, the the storytelling was it, it, the story was very important. It wasn't about the stars. It wasn't about the... the first week grosses, it was the story, and it was director-driven and, you know, writer-driven, and and now it's, like, how much money is it going to make the first weekend, and if it doesn't, then everybody panics, and it's sort of all driven by that now, and I think, and then they thought, you know, actors would drive people in the theaters, so they gave them large paychecks, and I think there's, they need to figure out, it's the story, like, once upon a time, that gets people in the theaters, and that's why Pixar does such a great job, is they recognize, like, the huge importance of having your story be compelling. And um, that's what the great thing is about, you know, being able to put your movies up on YouTube. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that isn't, you know, everybody has a story to tell is my theory. But, you know, how you tell it is <laughs> what sets you apart. But, uh, you know, I... I don't know if it'll ever be recognized. I, I, I'm going to try to be an optimist and not a cynic and hope that it cycles back to the 70s era of thinking um, because I totally agree with you. You know, and, and also the 70s were a period of the anti-hero, which is something you guys mm-hmm. are exploring as well as you described. And obviously there's a, a huge uh, taste for that still as well. I mean, I think all the great shows that we see on television, which I think television is going through kind of a 70s renaissance of its own right now. Oh, I, I agree. mean, all, I agree. all of these shows are led by anti-heroes. So, so yeah. there's there's, yeah. there's a craving for that kind of portrayal. And, and you guys are doing it with Broken Toy, with your lead. Yeah, and 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 they do inspire us to, to keep, go, you know, keep going on. It's like, a, obviously, a lot of the network's 
have to uh, sort of cater to a very broad audience. And so, you know, they do the procedurals and all, but, you know, shows, you know, obviously that are on like, on cable, um, they, they definitely are doing the sort of anti-hero and the dark stories that, you know, that people don't, don't you know, they, they don't always like to admit, but they, you know, they like seeing the sort of, uh, you know, the sinners. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, with, with the anti-hero thing, it's um, people, you know, Breaking Bad and Mad Men even is an anti-hero and uh, Dexter and all those. Uh, it's it's a thing that people are just – It's I hope that studios see that, that people like conflict and they like um, ambiguity. And that's the thing with mm. studios is they think everything has to be one or the other. And a lot of the scripts that we've written – together we have elements of horror we have elements of drama we have elements of comedy because that's what life is to us but we always get our scripts back with notes saying well you had a joke in this action scene i don't understand what your tone is and it's like no my tone is life like it's it's just that's how it is i mean people make jokes at funerals i mean it's yeah, they can't there, see There's that. almost this constant phobia that, that the studios have right now. There's, there's this constant fear of, will the audience get it? And really, it's really not based on anything. It's, you know, it, it's this fear that somehow the audience won't understand what's going on. So they, they really do avoid putting anything that's thought-provoking. Um, they, they really want – because they go for what's called the four corners, and they want to have it as, you know, every single movie will appeal to every single demographic, and everyone will be having fun, and nobody will hate it. And, you know, they, and I understand it's, it's, a, it's a money-making industry that you want to have your product appeal to everybody. But um, they definitely are doing themselves a disservice because they are missing out as um, you know as shows like you know Breaking Breaking Bad and Mad Men are starting to show. I mean, as they cl- they clean up on the awards time and again because they are when you do have an anti-hero, it immediately almost by definition you are adding an extra layer to your characters. You're you're showing a bad person doing good. And that adds the the depth to these characters that a lot of um, a lot of the mainstream shows and even mainstream movies are missing. Yeah, and 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 I completely agree with you. I mean, by trying to appeal to everyone, uh, I mean, at the point in fact, they they pretty much appeal to no one because they're yeah. a lot of times yeah. because they're playing playing to the absolute lowest common denominator. They're always uh, shortchanging an audience's uh, intelligence, and you know, I think yeah, somebody I like. Somebody like Kubrick, I mean, we have nothing like Kubrick now, that level of ambiguity no. that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, yeah. he would have no place making movies today. Oh, yeah, um, he probably wouldn't be able to. You know, there would be, he, and, and to be honest, he would be doing, he would, you know, not to, I, I don't necessarily think that the Internet is, is the, the, you know, the greatest of format, but he, his, his only option at this point would be actually to go off anti-studio and make his own thing. I think so, too, yeah. So, um, before I let you go, I got to hear about your Comic Con experience because <laughs> obviously you're you're creating something that that, that is, is is so great for fans. I mean, you're you're gaining a rabid fan base uh, for Broken Toy, and so you're yeah. in a position where you're in the greatest fan arena of the year uh, <laughs> yeah. with Comic Con. What was that experience like? You know, it's our first like? time at Comic Con. We've, we've gone to comic conventions a ton. Um, you know, two of our part, one of our partners is in New York, one of them is in Chicago. They go to the Wizard Con and the New York Comic uh, Comic Con all the time. And, you know, so we've been there, but we had never gone to the San Diego one. So that was our first experience there. And it's, it's, it's amazing. You're basically going into a city where almost one-third of the people are in costumes, so it it almost is like it's taken out of a movie. Like if you would drop something from you know the, the the 60s into this place where everyone's wearing costumes and have wings, they would think that they were you know in in Buck Rogers times. Like it's just it's just sort of odd seeing somebody walk away with a 10 foot sword, or you know another person having a, you know an, a, a 15 foot wingspan as they try to get into the doors. But there's this this sort of great vibe while you're there that everybody's supportive. And it's you know with our with our sort of demographic with co- you know the comic book fanboys, we're sort of pigeonholed as being very very cynical and very um, uh, you know snarky to one another. Um, and it, that's completely you know not the the situation when you go to like the San Diego Comic Con. Everybody there is so excited 
to just be involved and have a format and a forum to actually be talking to one another. So while we were there, anybody we talked to, they immediately were excited. They would just they mm. almost give you the benefit of the doubt that this is going to be good, um, which is really not something that's that's sort of uh, uh, typical of of you know what we're seen as as you know the the fat guy at uh, you know the Simpsons comic book shop. <laughs> we're typically the guy that's like, like, well, actually, you know, Greedo would have shed first regardless, and, you know, that's often how we're reviewed, and it was really nice to go to an environment where everybody is excited. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I especially found it in, inspiring, and I wish a lot of studio execs would just go walk the floor there, because I found there were more little girls dressed as different characters, male or female, and I didn't see I saw more little girls than little boys doing it, and it was really yeah. exciting to see that, you know, women are a huge part of sci-fi, and, and I think, you know, Battlestar Galactica recognized that, and, and there's a few people that have picked up on that demographic, but, um, yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be a game changer coming up pretty soon. I'm really excited to see the next generation of children growing up on what we have now. Yeah, yeah there was yeah. A, a, a huge, a huge amounts of daughters with their fathers dressed as, you know, as uh, superheroes, and that, it's fun to see. And so, yeah, it was cool. It's really, um, I mean, that's a great point that that the female demographic is largely ignored when it comes to, you know, for lack of a better term, geek uh, culture. Yeah, like. definitely. You know, it's you know, and the studios don't seem to pick up on it, but you know. It's it is interesting when you actually sit back and you actually watch some of the more popular shows uh, in in terms of sci-fi, even fantasy. I mean, I would I would argue that despite the sort of nudity issues that that are sort of on the forefront right now of Game of Thrones, if you actually watch Game of Thrones, the majority of that show is women driven. All of the wars, all of the battles, they really are the women pushing in these stories. And mm. same thing with Battlestar Galactica. There's this huge, you know, component to, you know, whether it be the president or, you know, um, uh, you know, or Starbucks and stuff. There, there are these, these sort of presences of, of women that um, I, I really don't think the studios have, have actually become aware of, but they, it is there. It's they, they are a driving force. Yeah. Uh, so t- tell our audience, if you could, how they can find your, your series. But if you go to, uh, right now, the, the easiest way to do it is you, you can either go to forewarnfilms.com or you can go to YouTube backslash forewarnfilms. We have all the episodes up there. They are easily accessible. Um, you can uh, subscribe and just watch as we, as we put each one out. 